Wow, thank you, Anthony. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. So whoever you are and wherever you may be on your own life's journey, you are most definitely welcome here at the Sunderland Congregational Church, or part of the United Church of Christ. We are now in the second Sunday of Lent, this season of introspection, a time also to look up at Jesus on the cross and to try to just imagine how much God must love us to allow all of that to happen. And you know, uh, last night, Sharon, my wife and I, we went to uh, UMass to see a concert at Byzantine uh, Recital Hall, and it was by Stephen Banks. And Stephen Banks played the oboe, the alto sax, and the sax. And uh, what was really great about this concert, it was free. Um, not a penny to get in to see this. And he was really amazing. He has, he has soloed with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And uh, he was teaching a class there for their master students. And so uh, this was a free offering. And, you know, for me, who has absolutely no musical talent whatsoever, uh, to watch these people, or like Anthony just now, it, it just it, it impresses me, because um, I just don't know how that happens. And when he was playing his instrument, you know, he, he could have stood there, you know, solid like a soldier, never moved. Uh, but with that instrument, it was like he was dancing on the stage. I mean, uh, you know, he, his movements just kind of, they added to the whole melody that he was playing. And you could tell that his entire body was engaged in the music. And, and that idea, that entire body, that, it, that, that whole body experience, I kind of hope that, you know, worship and faith can be that kind of thing. We, we shouldn't limit faith to, you know, our thoughts at one point, our, our heart at another, our souls at another. It should be this whole body experience that all of us comes together and is expressed through faith because we're talking about the absolute love of God, the inexplicable love of God that is manifest in that cross. And, and for me, Lent is that time when we think about how much God means to me, and each one of us can say, to me. Um, and Stephen Banks closed out the night with a piece that he, he composed, and he called it um, um, Surrender. And by surrender, he said it wasn't like giving up. It wasn't like, you know, white flag, surrender. And he said as he composed it a year ago, as he was writing it, he didn't actually know what surrender meant. And as he's looking back at it last night to play it, he said, maybe that's what surrender meant. And then he told the audience, ask me in a year, again, what surrender means. And so it's like this ongoing awakening to what it means to surrender, to, to give yourself over to something. Not to wave the white flag, but to willingly give yourself over. And so we talked about that last Sunday with Jesus in the desert for 40 days. We'll talk about it again today in his, in his uh, little dialogue with Peter. Uh, but this idea that Jesus gave himself over to the will of God rather than to his own, I think that's something that we need to try to replicate in our Lenten experience, giving ourselves over to God. And I hope that worship can play a little part in that giving ourselves over, surrendering to God. And so with all of that said, let us begin our worship together. Uh, please stand if you are able for our opening hymn and candle lighting, Come Down, O Love Divine, Red Hymnal number 239.
now turn to our bulletin for the call to worship. God calls us by name and gives us new names. We are summoned to faithfulness and to selfless action in our lives. We are part of God's covenant people, a part of the Abrahamic faiths. Lent invites us to move forward with Christ. In our covenant with Jesus, we are asked to continue God's work. How awesome it is to share in his loving ministry. Let us always remember Jesus' costly sacrifice. May we turn to him in our worship and also as we lead our daily lives. We seek to be worthy of our Lord Jesus and to honor And now coming together, as all of us here gathered, those right now on Zoom and later through FCAT, our unison prayer. In trust and confidence, we call on your name, Holy God, as we gather on this Lenten Sunday. We desire to know you more fully and to serve you more faithfully. We have heard your amazing promises given to the ancestors of our shared faith. We desire to grow stronger in our faith as Abraham and Sarah did in theirs. We now seek your word for us in our own day. As they passed on their faith to new generations, we seek to teach and live in such a way that sustains and grows the faith today. Keep us from confusing human opinion with your truth and replacing the difficulties of following Jesus with alternatives of our own making. May this sacred hour focus our hearts, minds, and souls on listening for your still speaking word. Amen. Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 through 7 and 15 16 the sign of the covenant when Abram was 99 years old the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him I am God Almighty walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous then Abram fell on his face and God said to him as for me this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but you shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring as after you. And God said to Abram, Abraham, as for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations, kings of peoples shall come from her. Well, so my dog, um, as I've talked about before, is not really my dog, it's Sharon's dog. And as I come home on Sundays, I thought that my dog really cared that I showed up. Because when I would come home, the dog would go nuts. I'd be out in the driveway and I could already hear the dog inside getting all excited and barking and jumping around and all that. And I said, oh my gosh, my dog actually misses me. And then I put two and two together. 
my dog is sometimes smarter than I thought, and my dog can realize Sunday is different than any other day of the week. And so the dog knows that our routine is different on Sunday, and he put it all together that when Sundays come along, on Sundays, my wife Sharon gives him a special treat. And it's one of these grainies. And I don't know what's in here, but it's like, it's like dog cocaine. Once you're on it, you can't get off. Um, and so these greenies are just unbelievable. And my dog gets this greenie to brush his teeth once a week on Sunday, and he's smart enough to put it all together that when I show up after my church services and I come home, this is waiting for him. So my dog wasn't excited to see me. He was excited about the greenie. And so... I was going to tell the kids, and Sakura, I can tell you that if I, my dog is that smart, but if I put a greenie there, and I, if I took out, you know, some cash, stay there, Roman. <laughs> so this is only a dollar, but I'm going to make believe it's a hundred. And so if I put a hundred dollar bill down there and a greenie there, I would tell the kids, what do you think my dog would do? Would the dog realize that if he went for the bill, he could have like a bushel basket of greenies? Or would he just go for the obvious, you know, treat right off the bat of the greenie? And, and all the kids knew that he's going to go right for the greenie, the immediate reward. And so the dog can't see that the $100 bill is a bushel basket of greenies. And so in today's gospel, we're going to hear this story about Jesus saying, for the first time, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to resurrect. And Peter gets so upset with this that he says, no, Jesus, listen to me. This is the way it's going to be. And that really gets quite a reaction from Jesus, as we'll talk about. But Peter could not see, you know, the unseen value of Jesus. All he could see was that things are going really well. Let's keep along this path. He wanted to see the obvious. He couldn't see past the obvious to the greater value that Jesus was trying to make him aware of that's unseen. And so I would tell the children that faith is this blessing of seeing the unseen. With faith, we can see and acknowledge things that other people who don't have faith cannot see and cannot acknowledge. And that by coming to church, by going to Sunday school, that helps us like putting on these glasses. You guys just become blurs without it, but you become clear when I put my glasses on. It's the same thing with faith. Faith helps us to see the greater things, the things that Jesus is talking about instead of the immediate reward. And so I was kind of hoping that the kids would realize um, with that dog story that it's obvious that, you know, this is a quick reward, this is not. But, you know, $100 even for a kid means a lot, even though this is a beat-up old dollar bill. But the idea is, is this is a lot more valuable than this, and we get to see this through faith. So that's our message for the children, the young at heart. And we're also blessed today. We have our bell choir and their anthem today is Hymn of Promise.
Thank you, Bell Choir. Beautiful. It's now a chance for us to share our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. Um, we offer continuing prayers for Ukraine. It looks like that battle is going to be a tough spring over there, so we pray for uh, that violence-torn area of our world. We also offer prayers for um, that war that is now taking place between Israel and Hamas and Gaza. We pray for all of those humans that are just suffering so terribly over there, and it looks like they will for quite a while, even after the actual violence ceases. We do pray that it doesn't spread any further, uh, but all of these wars, we keep them in our mind. We also continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. I'd like to offer prayers for friends of mine, Richard and Joseph, and one who is battling a severe blood disorder. Also, prayers for a friend's mother who passed away just yesterday, Jermaine Matalevich. Um, when I served in Scranton, she was um, a really close per friend down there, and so offering prayers for Jermaine Matalevich that she may rest in peace as well. Are there any other joys, celebrations, concerns anyone would like to offer before we hit the yellow sheet? Okay, seeing none, how about we go to our yellow sheet and offer our prayers for Alan, Alice, Amy, and Tom, Antonia, and family, Angie, Art, Bill, Bill, Bonnie, Brenda, Chris, and family, Cheryl, Cindy, Denise, Frank, Grayson, Heather, Irv, Jeff, Jim, John, John, Kathy, Leslie, Lindy, Lynn, Marsha, Mary Jane and Joe, Michelle, Mike, Pauline, Sandra, Sandra and John, Steve, Stephen, Thelma, Virginia and Richard, Wink, victims of violence and natural disasters anywhere in the world, and we pray for peace on earth. And may we now turn inward for just a few moments of silence in the midst of our public worship to then offer God our prayers that we just can't seem to say out loud. So just a few moments of silence. God of all time and of all generations, whose revelation in and through Jesus Christ allows us to self-sacrifice, also calls us to humbleness and risk-taking service. We dare to listen for your call, knowing that it may draw us out of step with the expectations of our culture, realizing that you may lead us away from our dependence on the things that we have accumulated and the ideas that we have grown accustomed to. We still dare to follow. We take that risk, longing for the day when all the families of all the nations may dwell peaceably together on earth, and trusting in your eternal presence and that presence right here, right now, we ask that you hear and answer our prayers that we have shared with you and will share with you in this sacred hour of worship. And these things, as always, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And may we now together share in the prayer that Jesus gave to us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> who wish to save their lives, they will lose them, said Jesus. And those who lose themselves for Christ's sake and for that of the gospel, they will discover unexpected blessings. We are invited to give as we are able, to help carry the cross of Christ, in other words, and to do the hard work of building the reign of God here on earth. Therefore, may our contributions be as generous as our faith expects and also as our conditions in life allow. And donations can be accepted now in person or if you're joining us via Zoom or FCAT, they can always be mailed here to the church if you so choose. However you choose to give, it is appreciated. <laughs>
accepted, O Lord, these offerings, now to be placed here in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and for all others. As we've already heard about God's covenant with Abraham, the second of the biblical covenants, and that he promised him a child. Abraham is a hundred, and also his wife Sarah is 90 years old, and that's a blessing. I don't know if it would be for me, but it is in the Bible for Abraham and Sarah, 90 and 100 years old. Their child is to be named Isaac, which means laughter. And so even with all of the unexpectedness of Isaac's birth, you know, the, the hopelessness of having a child born to these parents who have no heir, and yet God has promised them future generations beyond counting. How was it to happen? And yet God gave them that child in their elderly age, 90 and 100 years old. And Sarah said, I laugh. I give joy to God. We are a place of unexpected hope and the promises of joy that may not be obvious in the rest of the world. We see through faith what others cannot see. And that's only possible because of people like you who continue to support this church and its work through being here, through your work, and also through your donations. So may God bless you, and may God bless these donations to his purpose. In God's name we pray. Amen. And our reflecting hymn today is Red Hymnal number 157, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Today's gospel is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. And then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo, undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And Jesus said this to all quite openly. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at the disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And Jesus called the crowd together with his disciples, and he said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, 
take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for that of the gospel, they will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the entire world and then forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with all of the holy angels. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be accepted to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. So my daughter's job requires that she has to travel an awful lot. And, and she likes the traveling. I think that's why she, she took that job. Um, I'm not much of a traveler, but she loves it. And so a couple weeks ago, she's flying back from Switzerland uh, to Logan Airport. And everything is going well. Smooth flight, she said. The food is good. They're actually ahead of schedule, which I didn't think happened all that often. So everything is going really well. Then as they get closer to Logan, the pilot comes over the intercom to tell the passengers in a very steady, matter-of-fact kind of voice, um, I just want to let you know there's nothing to worry about, and I expect a normal landing at Logan. Now, if I'm a passenger in that plane, and I hear the pilot come over with a very steady voice saying, I expect a normal landing, well, right then and there, I'm not expecting a normal landing. I don't think things are going to go very well. And so, sure enough, the pilot, after, you know, um, I'm expecting a very normal landing, adds that but. And the but is followed by, we seem to be having some trouble with the tires. All right, so when you're 35,000 feet above the Atlantic Ocean, tires are no big deal. If they're there or not, it don't matter. But when you're coming in to land at Logan with 450,000 pounds of people in plane, tires matter. And so that was the message. And with that message, I'm thinking about today's gospel. Everything in Jesus' life is, at this point is going along hunky-dory. Everything is going on. Just in chapter 8, the chapter we're in, uh, we're halfway into the gospel. In chapter 8, there's been a miraculous feeding of 4,000 people. The people are so impressed that they think that for sure this is the one sent by God, the Messiah. In chapter 8, there's a healing of a blind person. And so you've got this idea that Jesus cares about and can take care of the multitude, and he also has the time to care about some individual as well. No one escapes Jesus' attention. So everything is going so well. It's like the plane flying, you know, smooth flying, good food, ahead of schedule. Everything is going well. And at this point, Peter actually says to Peter when, when Jesus, I'm sorry, Peter says to Jesus when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? He blurts out, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the anointed one sent by God himself to save us. And so everything is going well. They're flying over the Atlantic. And then all of a sudden, in Caesarea Philippi, for the very first time, and Jesus will say it two more times after this so that no one can forget the message. So this is the first time. Everything is going well. Jesus says to them, and this is where we pick up today's gospel, we're going to go to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, the authorities are going to turn against me. They're going to arrest me. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. So Peter, thinking everything is going along fine, is saying to himself, why in the world would Jesus say that now? Everything is great. And so Jesus, Peter decides to take Jesus aside. He pulls Jesus aside from the group of the disciples, and he's taking him over here, and we're going to have a man-to-man, -man, Jesus, and I'm going to tell you the way I think things should be. And so as soon as he does that, well, that's kind of... Well, imagine you're in the plane, and the, the pilot has come over the announcer, and he said that, you know, the tires are not working. I decide I'm going to unbuckle my, my seatbelt, I'm going to march up towards that locked co cockpit door, and I'm going to bang on the door, and I want to tell that pilot, no, the tires are fine. Well, the only thing that's going to happen is they're going to put me in handcuffs, and that, that airline uh, marshal is going to walk me back to my seat, and I'm going to have to talk to some federal authorities, but nothing has changed about the tires. And so Peter has done just that on the ground with Jesus. He says, this is the way I think it should be. And Jesus gets so upset with Peter that he can't even look at Peter. He turns his back to Peter and he addresses the disciples. 
Peter can hear him, but Jesus can't even look at him. He's so mad. Remember I was talking about Stephen Banks and, and that whole idea about surrender, about giving yourself over to the will of God? Not giving up, but giving yourself over. And he was trying to figure out what that meant and that, that kind of awareness developed as he, you know, the more he thought about it. Well, remember last week we were talking about Jesus in the wilderness and for 40 days he's got to you know, work through what it means to be the Messiah. And he finally realizes that I've got to give myself, I have to surrender to the will of God. And now today you've got the same idea of, you know, Satan. And I don't think Satan is some kind of little devil on a shoulder. I think that's, you know, more for, for kids and for people 2,000 years ago. I think it's that struggle still. And now in, in Peter's, you know, idea that, you know, don't listen to God, listen to me instead. Don't take the hard path, take the easy path. I think, again, Jesus is confronted with this idea that you don't have to suffer. You don't have to go there and put your life on the line. And so Jesus is back almost in that wilderness moment. Get behind me, Satan. And so there's that idea of I've surrendered my will to God. So he turns his back on Peter. He addresses the disciples. And he says some of the harshest words that you'll ever hear come out of the mouth of Jesus. Get behind me, Satan, for you have not set your mind on divine things, you have set them on human things. Remember the story with the children about the, the greenie bite and the dollar? Well, Peter couldn't get past the greenie bite. He just couldn't see the value of the dollar. He couldn't see the purpose of what Jesus was going through. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus has to say to him. And all the disciples need to know that this is what it has to be. And the reason that it has to be is not because Jesus wants to suffer. It's not because Jesus is looking forward to sacrificing his life. You know, sometimes we think that Jesus was born so that he could die, but that's not why Jesus was born. Jesus was born to live, and that lived message cost him his life. He wasn't looking forward to it. And so Jesus knows that his message is subversive. Jesus knows that when he stands up for the weak and the powerless, the outcast, the ones that the rest of society looks down upon, almost wishes that they weren't there, don't count, I don't want to see you, don't bother me. When Jesus stands up for them and gives them power, and the power he brings down and says, you've got to give up some of your power, well, when you take on power, there are consequences. Alex Navalny was just murdered this past week in Russia, up in the Arctic at some gulag up there because Putin had to give the orders. And, you know, he, he didn't have to do that. Alex Navalny was in Western Europe, safe, because Putin had tried to poison him to death. And so they sent him to Western Europe. He got better, and, they, and then he got better, and he says, I'm going back to Russia. And everybody said, why are you going to go back to Russia? You know it's going to happen. They're going to imprison you. They're going to kill you. And Navalny knew all of this. And, and as soon as he got off the plane in Russia, they did exactly that. They arrested him, and this week they killed him. And Navalny says that I... I believe in something greater for Russia. I don't think Putin and this kind of people is what Russia is all about. I think Mother Russia can be better than this. And so he goes back, even though he knows the consequences of what it means to take on power, he goes back. And he actually told his family and friends, if they kill me, you need to continue to work for better Russia. And so he goes and he sacrifices his life, not because he didn't love his life, not because he wanted to suffer, not because he wanted to die up in the Arctic, but because he cared so much about what he believed in so strongly. So Jesus, everything is going along fine and dandy. He tells them, I've got to go there because this is what I have to do. I've surrendered to the will of God. I believe in this, miss this message and this mission. I will do whatever it takes. And so he goes and he surrenders his life. And so, you know, in a day and an age when churches do everything imaginable to get people through the door, we, we try to make this to be, you know, the, the best experience possible. Look at what Jesus does. He's turned his back on Peter. I cannot look at you right now. He talks to the disciples, and he says, you know, get behind me, Satan. You've got to set your mind on God and not on you, and you've got to surrender. And now you get this image that there are all these other people. So I don't, I can't, I don't know exactly what, what it's like, but you can imagine Jesus and his little group of disciples. And then surrounding this whole group, there's a crowd. And this crowd does not have to be followers of Jesus. They do not have to be believers in Jesus. They, there might be some, there may not be others. But you know, and we don't know who the crowd is. They're not defined, but there's these other people who may know Jesus, may not know Jesus. And Jesus calls the crowd over. 
people who may know him, may not, calls them all over. And Jesus says to them, if any of you, people who know him, people who don't, people who believe in him, or people who don't, if any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So, you know, for me, that's that whole message that, you know, you, just, you can't just wish the bad way. You've got to face it head on. And if you really believe in what Jesus started, if we really believe that there, there can be a better world if we are willing to follow Jesus, Jesus says, don't think it's going to be easy. There are going to be prices to pay. It's going to be hard. But Jesus also says, it's worth it. So my daughter is flying across the ocean. Everything is going well. Um, they come down for the landing, not sure about the tires. The tires are just fine. Uh, but there must have been some problem because maybe the tires didn't steer or something because they had to send out one of those big trucks, you know, that takes a plane and kind of drags it to where it needs to go. So there was some kind of a problem with the tires. So they couldn't get to the, to the gangway into the airport on its own. It had to be, you know, dragged there by this truck. And so it needed help. So the same message with Jesus. When we have our difficulties in life, when we are asked to carry our cross, whatever our crosses are now, whatever they will be, each of us has our own cross, don't know what they are, and you know, it's not, not important that I know, it's only important that you and God know. You have those crosses now, there will be more in the future. And Jesus says, when you have those crosses, just like that plane that needed that little extra help to get to the, to the airport, airport, Jesus is there. Because Jesus suffered, because Jesus knows pain, because Jesus died and was fearful of death, not like, oh, I'm going to rise up in three days. He was terrified of death. Because he's gone through all of that like us, when we have our crosses to bear, whatever they may be for any of us, Jesus is there with us. Jesus will get us there to the airport gangway because Jesus has already walked that path. So our job is to follow Jesus and carry our own crosses. It's going to be hard to change the world. It's hard to talk to power. But we need to make a better world than the one we've got. And Jesus says you can do it. It's going to be hard. But when it's at its hardest, I'm there with you and for you. So may we trust in that and may we do our best to carry our cross and to make a difference. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And today's hymn of closing is Abide With Me, read hymn number 209, verses 1 and 4, Anthony, or? Yes, 1 and 4.
well. Thank you for coming out and joining us for worship on this, the second Sunday of the Lenten season. I do hope to see you in uh, Hatfield, maybe in person, and then you can share in our little reception that follows. And if you can't get there in person, uh, we will be, I think the, uh, the uh, link has already been sent out, right, Judy? That went out last Friday. So the link is already out if you would like to uh, join that talk in person. And you'll be supporting two of our own, Reverend Cheryl and Reverend Linda, um, who are talking again about the marginalized many. So I do hope to see many of you on Wednesday, if possible. Let us now share in our benediction and our congregational response as we enter into the week to do and to be the people of God. Dare this week to follow wherever Jesus leads. Dare to love and care about others as Jesus would have us do whoever they are. Do not be ashamed to question the values of this world. Rather, dare to follow the different path that Jesus trod. May we live into the covenant of God's people, May we trust wholeheartedly in the promises of God. May we honor Jesus' cross by helping to carry the burden of others. And may the cross of Christ fill us with the grace needed to serve selflessly. So let us now go forth to love and serve the Lord in all that we do among all whom we may meet. Amen. Amen.